I just I've just spent we just spent an hour with Andy Earl, right? And and I, all I heard was my stomach rumbling <laughs> all the way through it. That was basically it. That was that was my takeaway. It was like eat more food before you do one of these. Yeah, that was that was a lot. My face hurts from smiling. He actually had so many yeah. funny stories as well. He, he is such, and you can and you can see exactly how this guy just puts people at ease. Mm. Um, there's no airs or graces. The guys photograph more people he can shake a stick at. Honestly, everyone. From and he's King's... so humble and so energetic and passionate about photography as a medium, and I just think that exudes off of him. It does. Like I feel excited to go take photos right now. I want to go and look at a Rothko <laughs> painting, right? Yeah, you know, it's just that's bonkers and. and you know, when I sit around thinking, what should I do? I'm looking for inspiration. You realise that the people who are really good at this stuff, they work really hard at it. Mm. He works really hard at getting inspired, informing his vision, you know. Works really hard on the shoot, thinking about the shoot. It's still, it's still now, you know, when he's... He couldn't be more established. He knows he has to be nervous the night before a shoot. Yeah. Who does he get nervous photographing? But I think that that's so great. I think that's what creativity is. It's that nervous energy and it's fueling it into the right direction yeah. to make something something great which he has <laughs> yeah yeah and now he gets to look at gets to use loads of his pictures as well which is <laughs> awesome <laughs> brilliant yeah an absolute great conversation and i can't wait for everybody else to hear it me too thanks rosie thank you jonathan hello and we're here today with andy earl um if you'd like to give us a hello hi thank you very much well thanks for thanks for coming down i'm and really looking thanks forward to for it. coming to talk to us we're I really see. excited to have a conversation with you we've got jonathan here as well and yes, thank I am you. Rosie. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, Rosie. Okay, so let's just get straight into it. I think it would be really great to hear about, you know, how your career began. I know that you studied at Trent. Yep. And um and also did you do a year abroad in Baltimore as I well? I did, I did, I did. I was really fortunate. I mean I started off I mean, when I came to Trent, I wanted to be, initially, I wanted to be a racing driver. That's all I ever wanted to do. Yeah. And when I worked for a racing driver for um, a year, and then when it came to the end of the season, they didn't need me, so I came to art college instead, because the only other thing I liked doing was taking pictures. Um, and when and then when I got to Trent, I thought it was going to be like a more of a commercial photography course, mm -hmm. but it was full of basically a couple of very crazy tutors um, <laughs> one called Thomas Joshua Cooper who's an American and another one called Paul Hill and this was at the time when photography was being seen as as a slightly more of an art form it was very much the black and white image era where everybody was it spent ages in the bar in the dark dark room not the bathroom the dark room and it was um it was mad. I mean, I remember arriving there and being given a reading list of Carlos Castellani, Jenny to Ixland, uh, Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And I thought, what the heck is this? I've come to do photography. But it was about trying to get into your head and yeah. trying to get ideas out and finding your vision. That's what they were on about. Yeah. And I had the first year I was at Trent and then I, I was fortunate enough to go to Baltimore to the Maryland Institute, um, which was just the best experience ever to go age 20 or something to go over and, and spend a year in, in America. Yeah. But it was um, the course wasn't as good, but the, the cultural excitement and the difference of living in Baltimore mm. we were in the downtown area above the Greyhound bus station and it was sirens every night and things it was very different to Nottingham um, but it was it was very exciting and um, and then that's where I came across color photography and at Trent it was very much about black and white you know black and white what you do color mm. photography seen as a little bit sort of commercial you know yeah. that sort of thing so it was it was kind of um uh, they were uncertain about it um and anyway i ended up shooting in nottingham and i started yeah with color but because nottingham was always slightly gray i ended up putting a flash gun on the on the, ca the camera basically to try and enhance the colors because mm. otherwise they just look look dull and when I was doing it, once I, when I was doing some shots, I came back and all the pictures were blurry. And I thought, oh, what have I done? And what it was, was the, the, I'd set the shutter speed wrong. So instead of setting it at 125th, it was at like 30th of a second. So the flash went off, stilled the motion of the person. And then the exposure got, uh, got, got round and got a bit blurry. And I thought, oh, this is quite cool. You know, and it was very much an accident. And now throughout my career, that's been the biggest thing is that, when accidents happen, you move on to the next stage. Yeah. 
And so this, um, so I started shooting, and as I say, it was um, I, I did a whole load in Nottingham, but it was always a bit grey. And I decided I wanted something colourful. Went down to Ascot races, and with this camera, and it all got a bit more complicated than that. But I started off with a camera with one flash, and then I had three flashes on it. Then I was shooting with a plate camera because I wanted really good quality and all this sort of stuff. So I had an MPP with three flashes off it, walking down Ascot High Street in top hat and tail, so I'd look as though I fitted in. Yeah, and and just taking pictures and just completely and utterly in the zone of looking for pictures, looking for pictures, and um, and that was and this was in a sort of May June time, and then the the final show was in I think late June July. So my whole show was shot in the last month before. I uh, graduated, oh, wow. which was a bit of a daunting thing. <laughs> and, and I did them all and I had these pictures and I came back and I was quite excited and a lot of the students were quite interested in it. Yeah. And the tutors went, they had been better in black and white. Mm. You know? And I thought, no, 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 <laughs> this is all about colour. Yeah. And that, that's, that's what kicked me off really. Yeah. And, um, and then my, I was fortunate enough that my um, external assessor, was a lady called Sue Davis who ran was the director of the photographers gallery uh, down in London. Again, they they would do, you know, all sort of art photography as you know um, shows, mm. and um, she was doing organising a thing called European Colour Photography, and she said, "Would you like to put a couple of photographs in the exhibition?" And I went, "Yeah, great. You know, can I come to the opening sort of thing?" And and I did. So I put. Um, I also did some pictures of chickens and, and, and they were all blurry as well because when Ascot finished, I didn't know what to do. So there's, that's another story as well. <laughs> Actually, the chicken picture you should put in as well because that was basically, I was taking a picture, it was at Chatsworth House and there was a woman lying on the grass and there were some chickens in the foreground. I thought, oh, there's my colour, you know, try and work it. And I had all my leads and everything and as I went to take the picture, I tripped over the lead, the shutter went off and I got a picture of a chicken's ass. took it back to, co- <laughs> took it back to college and they said oh this is art you're back on course you know because it was blurry days there's chickens bum and you couldn't see the girl behind you know? <laughs> so again another accident so yeah. then i chased chickens for you know, or, or around uh, think the things to it and so it was a combination of those that ended up in the show and um uh when i had the, the opening um these two people came up and it was uh, Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood who were looking for somebody to do an album cover mm-hmm. and um, or just looking for, for ideas for photography. And they wanted to recreate uh, Manet's painting, Le Déjeuner Célèbre, um, which was sort of controversial in its time. And Malcolm McLaren, Ex Sex Pistols and Vivian were both, you know, f- fantastic people. Mm-hmm. But they were completely, you know, on a different planet, really. So... This was my first real job, and it was so weird. And and we went off and recreated it, and had to try and find a place where I had an old motorbike, and I was driving up and down riverbanks looking for somewhere that didn't have a housing estate behind it, so it looked a bit like the painting. And uh, then we we did it down in near where I live in Surrey, and uh, well, I did live in Surrey, and um, and we ended up photographing it there, and it was it came out, and the record company loved it and everybody but because it was um it was a band called bow wow wow and things and and the record company weren't sure about it and i think there was some hesitations and malcolm wanted exactly that contra- controversy and so it ended up coming out in stern magazine face magazine this sort of thing and eventually they said okay we'll do it because initially i hadn't been paid for it because they said oh if we can't use it we're not going to pay you and i said it's my first job I thought, oh no yeah and then McLaren turned around to RCA Records and when they said, yes, we'd like to do it, they said, well, you're going to have to pay Andy £2,000. And th- this was, you know, in the early 80s, it was a massive lot of money now, it was massive then. And and he he got it and gave it to me and I bought my first cameras, my lights, and that started me off. Wow, that yeah. is an incredible story. So it was fun. So it was all within a sort of period of, you know, a year or two. Yeah, it all took off quite quickly. If we could just go back to yeah. um, you studying in Baltimore, you were saying how you know, the course necessarily wasn't as, as structured, yeah. but just the cultural experience of being there influenced you. Um, when you were over there, did you notice a big difference in the creative process of the other students? Like, were you with American students over there as well? Very much so, yeah. It was American students, and, and they, there was a... It was really there was, a, it was a, there were a really interesting bunch of people. They were most of them were from sort of Maryland, that sort of area mm. that come to the to the. It was called the. Uh, uh, Baltimore uh, Maryland Institute it was called and the um, 
the 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 tutors and things they were very much into doing books they liked doing books so it was stories and like uh, Sally Mann and and pe- people like that they were there and there was there were, they had sort of other photographers coming in that were more sort of art photographers so it was it was much more playing on an idea and developing that idea through the quality of the teaching wasn't as good but the experience of being there was unbelievable because and a everybody went, I love your accent and all that stuff <laughs> and the other thing was was it was there was two of us that went out there um the girl called Deborah Baker who's um who's a brilliant photographer as well she was much better than I was and she and I were there we weren't together but we were working we were on the course together and um and she found it culturally really quite difficult I think being a woman over there mm-hmm. I mean it was a fairly um aggressive you know because we were doing shoots on the streets and walking around and stuff so i think she found that a bit uncomfortable yeah. um but to me that's what was everything looked so new everything looked so different you know the buildings were enormous all the signs the americana everywhere and i just thought oh, it's, you know i know the way people were and, and the whole culture was such a buzz yeah. really you know it was fantastic so I think um, it's if anything like that comes as an opportunity to anybody, I would definitely do it. I think the more you throw yourself into these things, the more the experiences. Definitely. Great. How did you find returning back in your final year back to Nottingham? As you said, grey and rainy, yeah. having just had this amazing eye open experience. Was it a hard transition back? Um, I think when I cause I was started, I started doing. I saw the William Eggleston show in the Museum of Modern Art, and there was also Ralph Gibson, who um, I was a black and white photographer whose work I really liked. And I went to some talks of his and this sort of thing when I was there. And so I'd, I'd had that sort of understanding of how that was working. And, and I think the, the tutors were really interested because they were interested in all these, these photographers as well. So that kind of worked quite well. But I because I came back and wanted to do colour, I felt as though I was sort of out of kilter really mm. and so for the, the first I mean the the, the the winter term is always sort of doing your dissertation and all that stuff so I did all that but and then when I was getting going I, I wasn't I was finding it I was, I was a bit sort of on my own because people weren't sure what I was doing they did have a color printer and everything there a create I think it was still the same one when I saw it the other day but um, it's uh, still that same sort of thing was going on but it was it, what I loved about being at Trent is it was the intensity of it. And mm. I mean, the, the, this chap, Tom Cooper, would, would, would do his prints in the dark rooms. We'd all go in there and, and be able to help. You'd be there at two o'clock in the morning holding a Dodger thing because he was doing this landscape and wanted it all to come into certain ways. So it, that all that nonsense was fantastic because it was just it was this whole kind of submerge yourself in what you're doing Mm. and just find what gives you a buzz and go for it and there was so much encouragement even though as I said they preferred it to be in black and white yeah (laughs) do you think that that resistance you know you were slightly on your own um sort of showing a different way do you think the resistance of your tutor saying oh it might have looked better in black and white did that almost spur you on to be like oh actually I think that I'm going to prove that it does look better in color I think yeah because I think because I'd been there was like Stephen Shaw William Eggleston there was that whole sort of American um, photographic culture coming through which was all to do with color and um and and it was it was looking at it in a way of like say Mondrian painting or something so it was very much about balances of color rather than balances of black and white and it, I'm not saying that uh, you know I work in that way but it was very much that kind of inquisitiveness that I found um so interesting and I mean I think they were interested because there was nobody else really doing colour at Trent at the time Mm. Um, and but it was I think it was it it went out it it went down well in the end but at the time it was sort of I was struggling a bit in the the spring term to try and get it to to come together so you really had to like back yourself You you did I mean everybody there was lots of encouragement but it was like what as in as all of us knows being photographers it's finding that idea and then realizing it and sometimes you start doing something and it's working mm. and then it falls apart mm. and you've got to go back and sort of pick yourself up and look at it from a slightly different angle and just keep going and going and I mean, with me as I say it was when I set the exposure wrong and I got this blurry effect I thought oh that looks rather fun you know and everyone went, well it's out of focus <laughs> you know but but it was it was that that sort of G'd me on so I suddenly thought wow this I hadn't seen this before there was a guy called Mark Cohen a photographer who had done some black and white pictures with a um a flash 
uh, using a flash outside and uh, with, a, with a big balloon and uh, of a, in front of a girl's face or something in the streets in, I don't know, somewhere in Newcastle or something like that. And I looked at that and I thought, that just looks great it looks so cool and it was it was that sort of then searching for that quirkiness of things that the as i say like this ralph gibson photographer he was black and white very sort of abstract mm -hmm. shapes and things but i just loved the the sort of uh oh it was like a sort of a, a malevich painting do you want know I mean? there was just this this whole sort of concept going on behind it which i now have learned more about but mm -hmm. i mean at the time i just i was intrigued by these things and wanted to find out more and i think that was always very much encouraged was the was the research and and when i was at trent i mean the history of photography it was sort of drummed into us a bit mm -hmm. but actually it's quite good because you suddenly look back and think oh yeah so and so did that back in the 30s yeah you know, that kind of stuff it does yeah. click it you're yeah. like okay it did inform all of this but it yeah. you know it takes getting to a certain stage to realize the relevance of it i yeah. think yeah, yeah it's putting it sort of into context and at the time yeah. you just think oh no not another lecture but uh, you know but at the same time it was that's what really really drew drew me through i think yeah great. and um with your creative process i'm interested i'm sure this has evolved over time but when you've got a project you're working on, do you like see that image in your head before you're taking it, or is it something that comes together in the moment? No, very. But I mean, like I was doing a shoot yesterday, as I just said, and the, the, we, I mean, we agreed to do it last week, and we were going to try and do it quickly in order to sort of keep the energy going which meant trying to come up with various ideas. So I, I come up with ideas of what I want to do and how I want to light it, roughly things like half that goes out the window when you started, but at least your your head's in that space and you're completely fo you know, focused on to how you want to do it, what you're trying to achieve, how you're trying to get those things to, to go. And I always find that if you go in there with quite a strong idea, I think, well, I might try this lighting, might try that. And then sometimes it just doesn't work or something happens or mm. half the time you're doing something and one light goes off and you think, oh, that looks good. You know, So it's, it's being opportunistic yeah. in that sort of thing, but it's, it's just sort of... Uh, you go in there with your antennae up and you're just looking for everything. I mean, personally, I prefer shooting outside than in a studio because mm. I find it more inspiring and more exciting and stuff like that. Sometimes I go into a studio and think, oh, God, where do I start? You know? yeah. so, so I have to sort of try and you, you build yourself props up to, to and, and things like that to make it. And then half the things we don't necessarily use, but at least you've gone through your thought process of what you want to do and you've got an idea. I mean... Rather than somebody coming in and say, oh, we'll just stand there and we'll do some pictures. So I was doing a portrait of you. I wouldn't do that, I don't think, unless there's something that I saw when you walked in. I just think, oh, great, I like you know, like certain things that I can want to try and do. This is how I maybe would try and like you. And then I might try and do it and think, well, that's not suiting what you're about. So mm. that's you, you just keep... You just keep moving the whole time. It's just you're, you're forever inquisitive as to what you can do with something. And I think, for me, that's what I've loved about photography. And yeah. it's just you know you've just that's been that that opportunity has been amazing. Definitely, it's yeah, it's really exciting to hear about you know your process and how it seems like quite like an immersive journey as yeah. well. And I think that's the interesting thing about photography is you can get so absorbed in it. And I've found with the degree as well that doing it you find out a lot about yourself like yeah. whereas other degrees yeah. you know you're, you're learning stuff whereas yeah. here you're learning about yourself whilst doing your degree and I think that's such like a special opportunity it is and I think that's what but, but that's it it's, you are I mean you're in, you're in that stage of your life where you've got to find where you're finding something that really excites you and I remember again going back to that with Ralph Gibson he was looking he'd look at pictures and he, he was looking at mine and he said and, the, and he said yeah these are good he said but they're not like you and I said, what do you mean? He said, you're trying to do other people's pictures, you know. And in a way, you end up having a bit of Ralph Gibson, a bit of William Eggleston, a bit of this and a bit of that. And you put it in the mix and out comes your pictures, you yeah. know. And I think that that was very much, that, that really made me think about things, made it quite sort of exciting. I mean, he's, he turned around and he said, photograph the way you move. And I said, what do you mean photograph the way you move? He said, you're quite energetic and you're doing these rather studied pictures. And so then when the flash went off and it all went blurry, I thought, oh, hello, this looks fun. Yeah. So that's how, how I think it kicked off. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm. Um, another question I'd like to ask you is, is there anyone in your life that you go to to get the truth so say you've done some work and you mm. think hey, i really want a, the honest opinion of this yeah. do you my, have anyone? sophie my wife 
definitely. Yeah. I mean, she's we've been together for forty odd years now, and and she's great because she'll look at it and say that's rubbish. You know? Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and there's also <laughs> other people. I mean, there's lots of people who I respect their their point of view. There's um, uh, when I left. Uh, Trent, I worked for an artist called Brian Clark, who lived up in uh, the Peak District, and I mean he he was a, a an artist and he did, he did paintings and stained glass windows and stuff, very very abstract, very funky. He was a punk, and I went to have an interview with him up there, and I drove up on my motorbike and had the interview on a bouncy castle in the garden. I thought this is weird, but that was what how he was he 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 thought and how he does things, and so he's he's always a go to. He's a good. He'll, I mean he's. Um, He'll look through my pictures and, and yeah, I mean, I really, really respect his point of view mm. and I really respect, respect his eye. He also knows Ralph Gibson. He's fascinated with photography, you know, he, he, he has a big sort of understanding of it all. But at the same time, um, when I did a book, he wrote an introduction and it was quite a nice sort of thing saying, you know, that I've got one foot in commercial and one foot in art, but basically... I'm an, I'm a commercial photographer. I'm not an art photographer, you know. I'd love to be an art photographer, but then to be honest, I'm I'm much more comfortable probably, you know, straddling the two. Yeah. And I think that seems to be the balance a lot of photographers have to strike, especially when they're starting up, is trying to do the commercial and art yeah. alongside pairing that together. Yeah. Um because I think in some aspects there's a bit of stigma around doing commercial work. People can almost yeah. be a little yeah. bit like they'll they'll hide it in their portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. But like, what's your perspective on well, that? Well, I think what where I've been fortunate is that basically doing record covers, it's about coming up with an idea, working with the music, the artists, or with the management, or with the record company, and and all this sort of thing. What do you want to do? Coming up with an idea, they've maybe seen something in your portfolio they like the feel of, and so that's what's your introduction in a way. So um, once once that's happened, I think that's that that's good. But what I've loved is for me it's always been still image i've done videos i did a video for the rolling stones and all sorts of things which i've enjoyed enormously and and, and it was good fun but to me it's that image it's that one shot that stands up mm. and uh, and if that picture then and when i take a picture i think yeah that's good but it's not till six months later you say okay maybe that one is good you yeah. know <laughs> you, you sort of think that one now works and it's that it's that playing with it all is what I've been doing. And I mean, the good thing for me that you know, I've done a lot of portraiture as well, but mainly it's the music uh, record covers, which has been working with some very exciting, you know, Storm Sorgerson who did all the Pink Floyd stuff. Uh, he and I worked together, and there was um, others a guy called Mark Farrow who who do all the, all the Pet Shop Boys, and I love his style of work as well. And there's lots of people that. I get a real buzz up and then working with something like Prince for heaven's sake you know I mean they are mm. you know he was com completely mad which was just lovely you know yeah. because there's something to, to really work with so it's it, that sort of thing's been very stimulating in fact just uh, a couple of weeks ago unfortunately Brian Griffin a photographer a black and white photographer who I had a lot of respect for and knew, knew reasonably well and he was you know he did some amazing pictures in, in the in the 80s and 90s or many 80s and then he just went across to film and never really I don't think made such a success of it mm -hmm. and it was it would then be the commerciality came in you know he could probably make more money doing it that's never really bothered me. I mean, no. I, I, my motivations, you know, fortunately, sometimes I get paid quite well, but that's completely secondary. It's 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 about doing the pictures. Yeah. And I think that was just a shame with Brian, because I think if he'd stayed with it, he 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 was one of the most seminal photographers of the you know, 80s and 90s, sort of thing. Yeah. So I, I'm getting the picture that it's very much about the picture for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you do much like post-production with your imagery or are you very like you shoot it and that's how you you want the final outcome my, yeah i think because i grew up without photoshop yeah and so my era was film as yeah. well so again you had to be when we were shooting on transparency you had to be quite accurate with your exposure it was in like a third or half of a stop otherwise it was it didn't work really well so the the accuracy of that was was really good and when digital came along um i sort of thought i've got to just join in you know and 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 get involved with it mm. but i wasn't completely literate at all and, and all that stuff so i was getting assistants who were sort of raised on nintendo to work to help me to do how to get the pictures <laughs> onto the screen and all that sort of thing <laughs> and how to get it working and and i really enjoyed um the whole palette you've got with digital yeah. you know and you've got with photoshop and all that side of things but at the end of the day for me, the pictures always 
in the picture. Mm -hmm. So it is about the lighting. It is about the balance of how these, how everything comes together, how much you do. In fact, I think I was mentioning to Jonathan, there was a, um, when we were here last time, there was a musician who, uh, in where I work, there are um, musicians here. And uh, he's, a, he's a producer who does amazing, you know, concerts and does recordings of stuff and things like that. And we were taught, he was doing a drum um, recording a drum thing and he was moving the microphone slightly this way, slightly that way, doing like that. I said, that's what we do with lights. We just adjust it to get the feel, mm -hmm. what we want and how we want to do it. And I thought, oh, so, you know, we're, every, there is, we are all together. The creative process is all together because it's all about sort of just, just trying to push the edge the whole time. Yeah, that's great. Do we want to start going into some specific? Yes, <clears throat> we want to pod chat hard now. Okay, <laughs> wanna, go, go. Yeah, harder. No, we want to talk about some actual people. I, I was so much you said there that I just kept my mouth shut because it was so okay. lovely to hear. But you should be reassured that um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance yeah. has crossed my desk a number of times. Has it? Yes, has it? I have passed it to students. And that's <laughs> I, that's a coincidence. I didn't know that you were no. you pushed that as well. Well, the only reason I got it because I was riding a motorbike. And I went through it and there was nothing about exactly. how to fix my carburation at all. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, no, it, it was great. I mean, just the, your love of photography is great. It, you know, and your love of, you. uh, love of, I'm going to say love of not being afraid to fail, but you're sort of talking mm -hmm. about, you know, things that go wrong and you just think, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's a great way to look at when yeah. things go wrong. That's brilliant. So I want to talk about when things go wrong. Yeah. Because... I've got loads of those stories and you yeah. must have some. Yeah. You, it can't just be me. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it, uh, sort of like talking about how you prep for a shoot and yeah. things like that. Mm. And it's the same doing, a, you know, whatever you're going to do, I'll always carry a spare camera, you know, and I'll always, start, now we have to have not necessarily a spare computer, but an, another way of accessing all this stuff if it all crashes and things. Um, but I remember doing a shoot with, um, okay, this is sounding a bit like one of those catch the name, but it was Paul McCartney and he wanted to do a, um, a big um, shoot for the centre of his album. It was Tug of War. And he was at Elstree Studios doing a rehearsal. And I was doing a lot of panoramic shots at the time because I loved the, you know, the panoramic camera because it was a um, 6 by 17 Linhoff. So your actual neg was that wide, you know. And, the, and so quality-wise, it was beautiful. And, but it was like normal vision, but super wide, like, like, like Vista Vision. You know, it wasn't, wasn't sort of uh, uh, distorted. And I was doing, and he wanted to do a picture of, of, for his, of the band playing for the centrefold. And we were up there, and I got all of a sudden standing up, and he went, what do you want to hear? Like, oh, wow, Jesus, and Paul McCartney's asking what do you want to hear. <laughs> but he was he was very accessible and anyway, he, he started playing and I went in and shot number four camera jammed I thought oh, oh and it was in my Linhoff and I didn't have a spare Linhoff because they're, they're quite rare um, but I had another camera and I had to keep ch changing and basically it, it just jammed the shutter just jammed and so I had an assistant there and so he was sort of I just said oh just take it and I put my other camera up and started shooting with it and thinking well I can just crop it which we ended up doing unfortunately but that was a time when you just die you know because you think oh, i haven't got the, you know the, the the camera's not working um and you have to sort of you know, I hope, I hope he doesn't see this paul mccartney because <laughs> he'll say oh that's why it was a bit grainy <laughs> and linda mccartney was there as a photographer as well so it was, all, it was wings or whatever else yeah that is awkward. No, I didn't mean to bring us all down. No, no, it was a, it was. A, we'll come back to the, mm. where things go wrong. Later. Yeah, yeah. But um, no, I, I have to ask you about Pink Floyd. I mean, let's talk about some actual pictures. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, I I, I, grew, I grew up with that with that album cover. Right. I, I, what happened? Well, why? I mean, that's working with um, Storm. Is Storm Thorgerson. Yeah. yeah. So basically, I mean that that whole surrealistic thing was something I was always interested in from coming out of of Trent and what and the pictures that I always got a buzz out of was was that sort of slight surrealism thing, whether it was McGree, whether it was whoever it was, and uh, and then um, with with Storm, he he would do he did. Uh, hypnosis was the name of his company they did lots of very um uh, fantastic album covers you know the classic ones that were the sort of surreal ones in the 60s 70s 80s and this sort of stuff and anyway he um we kind of got on quite well and he liked the way that i took pictures and and i've said oh i'd love to do something with you and i think there was a guy called keith breeden who was a designer i was working with who was doing a project with um with storm and they got i went out and photographed a band called ellis Beggs and howard and we shot them out in somewhere out in spain and uh, he'd made uh, all these sort of um 
big masks and things, but they were out of um, boilers, copper boilers out of out of a thing, and they they made them into sort of sculptures, and we had them up on the top of these weird hillsides. It was great, it was absolute nonsense, complete great. And then Storm said, oh, "I'm doing this Pink Floyd thing." To me, that was like you know that was the big one. That was like getting the you know the the the, the, the Apple campaign or something like that. Mm-hmm. And um, and so we went out to Spain because it was October, so we wanted we wanted the light and wanted to do the things. The album was called Delicate Sound of Thunder. And I said to Storm, I said, well, what's the idea? He said, oh, darling. He said, delicate sound is birds, thunder, thunder and lightning light bulbs. It's so interesting. And then it turned out it was also Salvador Dali's coat, which had all the glasses on it. And he'd use that and said, well, we'll put things. So he was using all these little tidbits of information and putting it together. So it's like I was saying, you end up just collecting little bits and things, oops, collecting little bits of things and then putting it together. And um, the... So we we shot the thing, I think, about seven or eight times. He wanted it yeah, midday sun, absolutely you know, stark, no no shadows. I was sort of thinking, oh, the light's really nice this evening. Why don't we do something? So we tried doing one like that. He didn't want it. Mm-hmm. So he just wanted literally middle of the day. And what we've got is the, the as I say, the, the funniest thing was arriving in Spain. It was a time you had to go through customs. And we had all these boxes of light bulbs. And they were opening up the light bulbs. He said, no, 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 in Spain we have the screw fix. These ones are no good. You know, these are, <laughs> trying to explain it for a pink boy poster. And and then behind the um, rocks um, was a company called Animal Actors, and they had all the birds. So I'd be going one, two, three, and they'd be throwing them in the air, and we had to catch them. So again, this isn't Photoshop. This had to be done for real. So when you're talking about how do you do it all, for me, it was all about you've got to get the right depth of field, you've got to get the thing. And with Storm, he wanted just a flat landscape. And I said, no, this landscape with the water and everything worked really well. Yeah. Um, and that's how it came together. Amazing. And and sort of and these these pictures sort of live on, you know. I mean, if, do you do you where where have you seen your pictures where, before? I mean, obviously you've seen them on album covers, yeah. you've seen them on posters, yeah. you've seen them on the sides of bus, buses, yeah. etc. Where else do you, have you? Well, seen? books and I mean, Brooklyn Museum's got that, and various other you know. So it, they do get put into sort of you know collections and galleries and that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean they're always. I mean the hut that's the thing is trying to monitor it I don't have an agent so I've never had a anybody who sort of really kept an eye on all these things and suddenly said oh I saw your picture on the you know on the cover of a magazine I said oh great but I didn't get paid for it you know <laughs> because I haven't got anybody chasing it so I'm getting a bit better with that now because we've been having a conversation but it's it's the um yeah it, for me it's the fun of doing it and it's even like when you see pictures that you've done and then they've cropped it right down just to the faces and I think well as long as I've seen it how I wanted to see it and it looks good and it's been received for what it was meant to be that's great and when you see them in different things I mean the amount of times I've seen pictures of Madonna where they've taken my picture and taken the background out mm. and you think oh hang on you know that's that's my that's my portrait of her sort of thing you know so that's that sort of thing is 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 you know, I'm I'm never been that bothered about, but um, I mean there are other times when people do use things that are. Um, I remember going to a concert once and sitting down and I'd taken my kids along and we were watching this band and I got the brochure out and I started going through it and I thought, oh, these are all my pictures, you know. And of course they hadn't had the rights to use them, mm. and um, it ended up they were redoing their deal. Um, this was it was wet, 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 and they'd done. We'd, I'd, just done the um, four weddings and a funeral poster, and so it was. They were then doing the um, the song "Love Is All Around" or something. So they were then re-signing, and it turned out that in order to re-sign, the record company had to pay an extra sum of money to clear what they should have already cleared beforehand because they weren't meant to use those pictures without permission. So it's it's that sort of thing. But again, if I had an agent, I'd probably got that all sorted. You know? yeah. but, but it's um, so. I think when when you're saying about you know your pictures. As long as I've, they've come out nicely and and I think they've worked, then I'm happy. And as you say, the, what I like about the Pink Floyd stuff, for instance, is that it does seem to have a sort of lasting value. You know, even now, people, you know, I did that in the 1980s. So even now, people look at it and and say, oh, it still looks reasonably fresh. You know. No, that's interesting. Just to pick up on you, because you were saying earlier about how you've got all these different influences. Yeah. And one of your teachers said, "Well, you, it looks like, right there. It looks like you're trying to copy them. Yeah. Where are you?" Yeah. 
and um and it, and it sounded when you said it originally it sounded almost as though you was you you come to accept that you can actually stand on the shoulders of giants i mean that's what science fiction authors write about you know yeah. yes i'm drawing on that person reference to that and that you're drawing on their eye you're drawing on their look you're drawing on their their thought process i think in a way like that and that's what i find you know when you suddenly see something you think how does this guy figure this out and, and you start looking through their pictures and noticing things i remember going with people going through my contact sheets and they say do you notice that you always go to this sort of distance to the person you're usually using a wide angle lens as soon as i use a standard lens i get lost you know i want the wide angle that's what makes it sort of, for me always always seems to work and it went to panoramic so you even might have but it was so it it was is that process of trying to find your your um your way of looking at things i think is good so so yes yeah, just just drawing on you know um I mean, there's still some brilliant photographers here as well, and how they work. And and, and I mean, I'm a big admirer of people like Nick Knight, for instance, who um, whose work has sort of it, it, what he's done and what he's done with Show Studio and how he works it. And but there are lots of art photographers who I really respect as well. So Richard Mizrak, an American photographer, I love his work. Love the, the and I, one of the first things I saw of his was a, a picture of a cactus at night in the desert, shot with a flash. And I thought, Ah, that's what I want to do, you know. So that's how I got involved with his work. So, and you know, that was years ago, and I'm still, still always keen to see what he's coming up with and what his ideas are. I think that's where like photography is such an interesting space because, like, you are building a patchwork of all your experiences, and yeah. and I think photography is just a, it's a representation of you know how you see the world, yeah. And each person's view is different. And obviously we're all seeing each other's views when we're looking at each other's yeah. work. Yeah. I think that yeah. critiques is one of the most important things. Uh, uh, and I think when we get down, I mean, I mean, the critiques we used to have at Trent when I was there would go on for ages, you know, mm. and you'd have people in tears and all sorts <laughs> of stuff. And, and you think, whoa, well, you know, but it, it, was, it was the intensity of it to try and sort of pick up whatever it is that people have got and make it work. And, and, and I mean, what I love is sometimes going to critiques and you see some pictures. There was one I did at, in Norwich once and we were there and there were some pictures and there were some pictures done on the um, up at Cromer on the beach and somebody had done pictures of beach huts at night and stuff and it looked really nice. Somebody else had done the same picture in the daytime and they didn't even know each other. I said, hold on a second, guys, you're <laughs> on the same course. You know, Have a look at what they're doing because yeah. you've both got the same interest but in a different, different aspect and stuff. And, and it's like if we all went out and took a picture and say, right, go and take a picture within 50 metres of here or something, we'll all take different pictures because mm. we'll all be attracted to different sorts of things. And yeah. I think that's quite interesting as well. It is a fascinating thing. So we, I'd like, you just mentioned sort of lighting at night and we looked at this yep. picture earlier on. Yeah. And so I know there's going to be people that are going to leaf through your, your website and think, how did he do that? It's always the question, you know, what camera did you use? What flash yep. did you use? You, you mentioned at the beginning with your, uh, what was it, MPP, wasn't it? Yeah, That's a 5.4 yeah, camera. Yeah, 5.4 yeah, camera. With lots of flashes on. Yeah. So um, how was this one lit? Because I, Okay, this one. I mean, that's. I mean, I, I I've always because I started with flash, and and so that immediately made things look a bit surreal. So that's without. Whenever I go out, I always have a flash. I don't necessarily use it all the time, but most of the time, it's there as a sort of. It's like my studio. I don't want to light this person. There was a shot I did of Morrissey, for instance. Sorry to go away from that, but there's a shot of Morrissey, and we, and he was meant to arrive at lunchtime to do the picture, and we we're in the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles and it was all amazing he didn't turn up so I was sort of sitting there with blue skies everything looked great mm. you know I mean on top of the Griffith Observatory where um, Johnny um, who was it uh, where the Rebel Without a Cause James Dean so where that was filmed and he had that sort of slightly James Dean fascination so I thought well we'll do it there and anyway he eventually turned up in the evening by which time it had gone completely cloudy and lost it and then I got my little one flash gun up and set it up and with a with a lead. It wasn't remote then, it was just a lead going to it. And then that flashed and lit him. So it was like a really beautiful lighting on him with all the grey background. So that kind of, for me, saved the day. And it took it to a different level, it took it to a different feeling. So with this picture here, um, this is a girl called Camilla, and it was down in uh, Rye on the south coast. And I'd seen this hut um, on a, on a, when I was down there and thought, I love the, 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 the weirdness of that. And she arrived wearing this um, uh, shirt with a big heart on it. And I said, well, let's go down to the beach. And so there I'm just using um, just a flash. So it's, it's a, probably a flash with a... I usually put a bit of soft on so it doesn't completely 
barbecue them. Um, but it's nothing nothing fancy. It's usually just a bit of you know trace or something like that. So that's just done with that. And when when that was actually digital, so I could see what I was doing. But back in the day, you hadn't got a clue. You know, you you do a Polaroid, and that will give you a rough idea that where your exposure was. But half the time, you come back and think, oh god, why didn't I put a bit more light on that or Okay, going back on that subject, so I'm, I'm diverting now. I remember being in the darkroom when I was at, at college at Trent and doing black and white prints. And because you, you put your, your paper in and you have to wait, you know, two minutes for it to come through and things, you'd be looking at your picture for mm -hmm. so much longer. So you'd be actually watching it. And quite often when you're looking at it and you think, why didn't I just put a reflector there? Or why didn't I do this? And you, be, you, you sort of, then you became submerged in your work. And I think that's something I do miss in a way is, is not having that sort of, you know, with digital, you're really like a Gatling gun, you know, you're just taking loads of pictures. And half the time that, that sort of stopping and studying and looking and thinking, well, where is that work? Does that work or doesn't it work? And I mean, even this morning I was going through some pictures we shot yesterday and I thought, oh, I knew I should have done that or I should have done this, you know, and all that stuff. But then, then the, but, and then you've got to remember that we only need one of that particular setup, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. So, but it's, um, yeah, I think it's always, it, it, it always keeps you on your toes, photography. Yeah. For sure. And that I definitely agree with analog. It does give you that moment to pause. Yeah. And like something that it feels like really pushes my patience sometimes, especially when yeah. I've, you know, started photography doing digital and then I'm yeah. trying out analog. Um, but it's interesting to hear it from the other way I around. Think it's, I think it's... Uh but I mean, and, and, and in a way, with di digital's amazing. Mm. You know, it's absolutely fantastic. But there again, I mean, here there's quite a few guys here who are brilliant um, photographers, and uh, and Jack, who runs this place, has a, a fascination for for photography and, and cameras. And he came in with ten Olympus pens the other day. You know, all sorts of stuff. But I mean, again, I've, when I've seen their pictures and they've they've processed them, just black and white pictures, posted them out, and they're on their phone. They look different on their phone mm. straight away. You've got that quality. You've got that that soul you've got that and that's what i'm forever looking for is that what's that that, that that little thing that makes it work yeah that's great talking about that little thing that makes it work can we talk about johnny cash yeah johnny cash so i mean there's there's a there's a real um silver bromide toned quality to these i don't know yeah. if they are shot on digital i don't know if they no, are. no 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 shot on film um and it was shot with uh, and then it was a, a lith print uh, process where what you do with a lith print is that you put it into two you put it in an a and b developer so you put it in for an a and all the grays come up and then when you've got the right sort of tonal range you then flip it into the second one and it brings the blacks up it gives you a sort of quite a rich brown not sepia it's richer than that sort of sort of quality and i started using that in the um in the 90s and things um because I just like the colour and, and like the contrast. It sort of gave you that oomph of contrast as well. Um, but with Johnny Cash, it was great because it was um, Rick Rubin, who uh, Def, um, Def Jam, who does everybody now. He does Jay-Z, Kanye West. You say he does them. What do you mean he does them? He's a producer. Right, so produces, he, right, he okay. produces them. I mean, he's like a guru, basically, and, um, and a fascinating character. And I was working with a guy called Martin Atkins, who was the designer on, on this. And he, he and they got me in to come and do the shoot. And they said, would you go out? And it was in Australia because he happened to be, Johnny Cash was in Australia with the Carter family and they were touring. So would you go out there? And I thought, but Johnny Cash is like, I mean, I've been doing all lots of young, you know, young musicians, you know, really, you know, beautiful women like Annie Lennox and, and all these sort of fantastic faces. So to be suddenly come up with Johnny Cash who looked like a geography map you know his his face was <laughs> was so weathered you know yeah. and he's had this amazing life of you know his, his songs and his you know, you know his, his, well, you've seen the film the drunkenness and all the all of all the things he went through and uh and I mean he was he was a sort of a wild looking man and uh, and so and I couldn't quite figure out why I was going out to do it but this chap Rick Rubin had, had sat him down and got him playing all these music and he got like nine inch nails and lots of unusual songs you two songs and got him just playing with the guitar and singing over it and it was amazing and it sort of completely was a new generation of you know opening opening him up to a new generation and my brief was was to do something where he looks iconic they said we want him to look iconic we want him man on the road and so it was man on the road with his guitar case was the initial idea and we found this dirt track that was, was outside of um, Melbourne 
in a place called Ballarat, which was an old gold mine and had a railway line that was now washed up and gone. We thought that would be perfect. And we dragged him out there and he, he couldn't figure out. He said, I've always been shot on stage or at home. Why am I suddenly going all the way in the back of this van to have this picture taken? <laughs> and he was quite an elderly gentleman then. And we went out there to do it. And I started shooting him going up and down the, the railway line with his guitar case. He looked like a preacher man to me. He's in this long black coat. But also it was like a stormy sky and then a field of wheat. So it kind of gave it that slightly religious -y vibe to it. And I thought, oh, this is nice. And when we were doing it, so this is a, a, a great example of how the picture grew. Mm. So when I started shooting it, it was looking again. Okay, I thought, no, I haven't got it yet. It doesn't, I haven't captured what I want, what, what, something that works. And there were two dogs that belonged to the station master that were just running around. And Johnny started sort of chatting to them, you know, playing with them. And I got him to stand in front of the field of wheat and the dogs came up and because it was filmed there's two frames where they're both just standing there looking out to the camera and then the wind got up and they ran off so it was about that moment and creating that moment and when it came back it's sort of that picture then held together it held as a um uh you know i think i was quite pleased i thought it quite worked anyway they were very pleased with it as well which was great and i ended up doing um another three albums for him but that that was the first thing it was called american recordings as well that was the first thing that we did and it was it but again we and i remember shooting it on film and we had to get it developed out in melbourne and i thought i'm going to some lab and they're going to wreck it you know what's going to mm -hmm. happen all that sort of thing but it worked it, it was good and they developed it all and we sat and printed it all and things like that it was it was just great fun amazing it's so interesting to hear the story behind the images because, you know, as a viewer, yeah. not knowing that context, you'd I think, mean, oh. to just that one with the dogs, the one next to him where he's throwing his guitar, um, I said to him, um, I, the, the guitar case, I said, because we did this shoot with the dogs and things, and then he said, oh, thanks, guys, I'm off now. So it was like two hours, and I thought... I've got a whole campaign to do. I can't do it all. So the next morning we had to sort of entice him out of his <laughs> hotel to do another shot. So just want to do one shot with your guitar. And he came down in his coat. It was just behind where the railway line was, uh, where, in, where Melbourne Station was, rather. And he came out and I said, any chance? Because I wanted to get the rebellious side of him. You know, he was... He was, he was such a naughty man. But that's what I wanted was to show that, that sort of, you know... You know, he were pretty, when he sang in San Quentin Prison, you know, and I've just got the prisoners all jeering for him and something. And so I said, would, would you mind throwing your guitar case? And he said, do you mind if I take the guitar out first? I said, no, help yourself. So he did, and then threw it in the air. And that, to me, that sort of captured the rebelness of him, you know. Yeah. So for me, I like the one of the dogs and stuff, and that's probably the more better known one. But the other one captured the spirit of what he was about. Yeah, and I think that's such a powerful thing to be able to do in a still image is, you know, capture that spirit that's, and yeah, emotion that's, yeah but that's what photography is about mm. isn't it it is you know it's about the, the, those feelings yeah and when you know you've got the shot it's just really exciting but even i mean the trouble is now you can see it all the time yeah whereas there you never really knew you know so i mean, I mean even developing the film you see the negative you think well i think that one's all right and then you get it back and you think, oops not sharp <laughs> you know that yeah. sort of stuff but um but the no so i think that that you know with, with photography now there is a there's a it's such a, an enjoyable thing to do. Yeah. And I think with the digital photography world now, you're almost so close to your work because you're seeing it so quickly yeah. that, like you said earlier, um, I think you said you six months later was like, oh, that is a good photo. Yeah. I think having that time and space between your work, you end up, yeah. you know, seeing it differently. And maybe that's what analog provided in the process because yeah. there was already that time there. Yeah. But yeah. digital is so instant, which obviously is yeah. great. <laughs> but also, it is instant. But also, I remember going up and up formats, you know, and then shooting with a 10.8 at one point, you know, because it slowed you right down. And you really, the brilliant thing was always upside down, you know, because it was, that's how it worked on those cameras. But, but it was, it was, it was, but actually, when you look at a picture, if you look at the picture upside down, that's the best way to see if the composition balance works, mm -hmm. you know. So things like that. And I even now I do that, not with this, well, just flip it on the screen now. Yeah. So, oh, no, it's not, the balance isn't quite right. But when you see it the right way up, was a lovely one of William Eggleston's one and it basically all the it was a SO station and there was a something else there was lines coming in everywhere and it looked so good and then when you turn it upside down it still looks brilliant you know so you think that's you know that's his eye you got the good balance mm. amazing so that's a, that's a lot of chat I mean, I'm mindful that there's the, there's always all the other technical questions we're not yeah. I'm not going to ask you what film no, you no. shot there because that's the one I'm not you know but someone's asking it try it but, 
now you've done it. <laughs> but um, D76 as yeah. well, yeah. So, um, but what we haven't said, and I'm mindful of this, is that, you know, you brought us here today, wandering through the tile yard, yeah. middle of London, everybody you pass, you shake hands and say hello to, everyone knows you. The first thing you do is a big mm -hmm. smile, they smile straight yeah. back at you, everybody wants to chat. So we've talked about the technical stuff, but there's negotiating that relationship with someone you only just meet. Yeah. And you talked about bringing your vision, but then earlier on you talked about sort of almost like a pictorial dialogue, you know, they, they, they look a bit better if you do it this way or turn that yeah. light off because it's not really yeah. about them, you know. Yeah. And um, that, that's, that's really hard for, for some people. I think d be yourself is, is the most important thing. People often put on a bit of a show or, or come, you know, especially if you're photographing. I mean, it's, I'm, I always, whenever I do somebody who it doesn't matter, I mean, like the night before a shoot, I'm always like really, really touch, really on edge and just trying to, you know, just, just thinking everything through and all that stuff. And even now, and, and if I go in there feeling too confident, I blow it. Mm. So I've got to go in there being nervous. Meeting some of these people, you know, who are very, very well known and very famous people. I and mean, sometimes I think, Oh Lord, you know, not quite sure. You know, hello, hello, <laughs> Mick Jagger, you know, or whatever it might be. But it's um, it it was it's if they see that you're you, and they see that you know what you want to do, and and you're, you're not going to REM is a good example. I did a lot of work with them for magazine stuff, and they turned around and when I came in to do it, they said, "Oh yeah, great, because we'll get into Andy. He knows what we're doing. We'll be in there, be fifteen minutes. He's done the shot, and it's, we're over." He said, "And there are other people who there want. Can I any chance for backstage pass?" I never asked for that. Never. If they say come to the concert, great. But otherwise, I, that wasn't that wasn't the thing. So it was very much being as professional as you are, but it was just how I felt comfortable and then they'd hopefully feel comfortable. So I think if there's that honesty with, with people, that's that's the first thing, because people could see if you're messing about or, 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 or that thing. And then it's a sort of um, getting onto their wavelength as well. I mean, this is a weird thing to say, but with, with portraiture, I'm much more interested in how the shapes of the picture balance in the work world rather than what their expression is. Half the time, does the picture flow? Does it work? You know, what's on the corner? How does that come together once it does? And then I can then sort of make, make sure they look good. But that, that's, to me, that's the, the last bit of it. It's just trying to get the feel of, of how, how the picture's coming together. And as I say, when I'm working outside, I much prefer it because you've got, oh, hang on, shall I have a bit of that wall in or not? Or shall you know put the sky in or not put the sky in? And, and it's just it's just sort of, you're, you're forever you know, looking and composing. But yeah, dealing, I mean, the, the, one of the biggest jumps was, I remember when starting out, I just didn't know how to talk to people you know and even you sort of say oh just go and ask somebody something what if you're a student you come up or even I've got to go and ask somebody any chance I could do usually I just go and say any chance I can take a picture you know using that backdrop blah 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 do you mind and and if people just say you know how much <laughs> that's the first thing most people say how much you give me for it but but usually it's um it's it's more of a, a, a you know just chatting you know and, and being relaxed with it and and I think one of the biggest things from a student's point of view is, is getting that confidence. Don't become cocky, but get that sort of self-confidence that you know actually what you're doing is you, you feel comfortable with. And, you're, and, and people will pick up on that so quickly. The amount of people I see that go and do photographs, say, of bands or something, and they've gone in there and you think, well, there's... there's there's no idea behind this there's no thought gone into it you know that does, hasn't come across and so therefore the management the artist or whoever it might be are going to feel that as well if you go in there saying okay i'm going to try this i'm not sure if it will work you think okay let's let's see what you got what's your idea and i think the more the more um I mean, you've got to make them look good. That's number one. But now, <laughs> the secondary is just trying to just sort of um, bring bring them into your, your what you want to do and things. And, and I mean, quite often, sometimes you say, you've got to listen to the music. You think, oh, do I have to? Because <laughs> some of it's not, not quite my cup of tea. But at the same time, it's that energy that's there or it's a something or it's a line of a lyric or something like that. And you think, that's, that's, that's my my thread you know that's that's what i'll go with is what what somebody said or even in a conversation they say something ah i get what you're doing you know what, what, how are you feeling does that make sense it does yeah. and that's it's really generous of you as well because i i i, I empathize with that sort of feeling nervous and i yeah. going in overconfident and blowing it yeah 
got that. I've worked out yeah. that I do that. I've done, I'm sure a lot of people will. Yeah. But I'm sure a lot of young people think that they are on, you know, their anxiety and their nervousness about this yeah. around the shoot, not knowing what to do, is means means they're less of something or something. You know, they're they're yeah. missing something. No. And it's or you know, it's imposter syndrome, let large, writ don't, large sort yeah, of thing. Don't don't be don't. Don't, you know, it's just, it just you've got to be a bit more confident in a way, and it's, a, and you can only get that from sort of being practicing and things like that. But it's, it's the, the it's the honesty thing. I think is the biggest thing because so many times you see people putting on a bit of a show, and you think, oh god, you know. And there's always one on the shoot. There will be a, a stylist or a PR person or thing like that. And you think, okay, <laughs> see you in a minute. <laughs> Let's get on with it. But there's just a sort of, um, you know. So your advice, say, for students, if they're doing, um, say, they've got their first job yep. on a shoot, say they're feeling nervous, is it better for them just to turn up and be like, yeah, I am nervous, but I'm here, I'm going to no, try my I wouldn't, best? I wouldn't, or... I wouldn't go in and say I'm nervous, because then that, that makes them nervous. Yeah. You know, so you've got to remember, you've got to, you've got to settle whoever you're working with or, or make them feel a bit confident. And if they go in and say, oh, I really like that, you know, if it say it was a musician or something, oh, I saw you at such and such a concert. They think, oh, yeah, so okay, you've done a bit of research, so yeah. I understand it. And then, and then, and I really like that song. And they, and they might say, what do you like about it? And you say, well, it just, it just felt so sort of open and, and soothing, or something like that. Whatever you might want to say about the song. And then they think, okay, so this person is interested in what I do. So therefore, I've been interested in working with them. Now, I'm using a musician as an example. I think you can use it in in anything. You go into sort of businesses and sometimes if I've got to do sort of businessy profile things um, that's always a bit awkward you know because I'm never quite sure what to do and and um, I had to do a whole load of portraits for Apple once and mm. they had to come in and with what, what what their inspiration was or something and we were photographed and somebody came with a tennis racket and I thought what am I doing with this <laughs> and and also they all came in uh, like casually dressed and then they wanted a formal picture and they all came in the suits but the whole thing about Apple was it was the relaxedness and the Steve Jobs, just a black T-shirt and things like that. You know, yeah, yeah, but they're all looking for their next job, so they want to look like they're a business. <laughs> for, you know, so it was quite funny just seeing the sort of the culture that goes on in these things. But it's a. Uh, um, but what I loved was is, is you're just meeting whenever you meet somebody. Everybody's got a bit of a story, or they're interesting, or you know where they live, or you know you, you speak to somebody. Like, oh yeah, I live in a croft in Scotland. You know? Really, you know, and they, they seem like a sort of whiz kid in London, you know, and it's, it's that's fascinating. So yeah, definitely, photography is a lot about the people and the photos. Yeah. Photography is also a passport to going to the most amazing places. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I've been in, you know, on icebergs and volcanoes, um, photographed King, you know, and all that nonsense. But it's it's you suddenly you're being present you know being with these sorts of people, you know. When I did him, it was a it was a nuisance because I turned up. We was at Dumfries House up in Scotland, and we'd had a we had a personal um, shoot to do there. My wife said, "I'm coming. I'm not going to miss out on this one." So she came as well. And when we got there, um, we had to set up all the lights in the in the room that was selected that they wanted to shoot in. And I was setting it up early in the morning, and this valet came down and said, "Sorry, could you keep the noise down? He's asleep upstairs." And I was sticking lights lights up and things like that so we had to keep it down and then when he came down he's he was so he was really lovely and he just wanted he says hello to everybody and i had a sort of a 20 minute slot 10 minutes he was still shaking hands like, come on <laughs> and and he was but he was really nice and very very um easy um and 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 it was again I didn't think, oh, it's it, it's who he, it was. It was about sort of how can I make this picture work? And I wanted all the grandiose of the room to come across. And so and there was big portraits of his ancestors on the wall. And the room was pink. It looked like a Barbara Cartland thing. So the whole thing was kind of quite, again, surreal in mm. a way. At the same time, I wanted to make him look like it, it worked. But they'd laid all the tables out, so it looked a bit weird in this dining room. But um, So you've got to think, how can I balance all this and, and, and play with it at the time? And you've only got five minutes. Yeah. You know, that's the other... I mean, like, the, the, the classic five minutes one is the Prince shoot I did, which was out... Um, it, he hadn't been photographed in Europe for about 10 years, and he had won some World Music Award out in Monte Carlo. So I got sent out with a... With a uh, a journalist and he and I were going to go and do a, a feature on Prince and we turned up there on the on the Sunday, we meant to be shooting on the Monday. 
that didn't happen. Then the next day it didn't happen. Then the next day it didn't happen. And his people will always say, uh, he, he wasn't Prince then. He was then the man formerly known as Prince. So he just had this sort of squiggle thing. So I remember saying to one of his bodyguards, who was big built guy with muscles, everyone, I said, I said, so what do you call him? So I call him Sir. And I said, well, I'm not calling him Sir. <laughs> and anyway, when he it eventually, he, he did a concert. Um, uh, up in, in an upstairs room in Monte Carlo and the Monte Carlo jet set were there and we were invited but we couldn't bring cameras so just to come and see what, what he was up to. Two o'clock in the morning it started and he played from two o'clock to four o'clock not a bead of sweat and at the end they came up and said he's ready for a picture. I said you might be, I'm not, we'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> so we ended up doing it on the roof of his hotel in, in the, uh, uh, I think it was the Hotel de Paris in Monte Carlo or something, we were on the roof of there. Got it all set up, everything ready. I didn't have an assistant, it was just myself and um, the uh, journalist Adrian Devoy and we were there um, ready and eventually he came late he was meant to be on some big you know um, launch thing at six o'clock and they said it's being wired worldwide and blah 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 he turns up at five past six I thought this isn't going to happen and he walked on in and I sort of said something like Oh, you really no, because he, he went. He he his what he wore was amazing. How how he is is amazing. I loved his complete eccentricity, but his passion for it was was second to none, and his ability, as I say, to to play. Anyway, he turned up with this looking absolutely magnificent, really, with the big blue collars and a cane with a big gold orb on it and all that sort of stuff. And I went in and and we started to take the pictures. And as 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 he walked in, the wind blew, and my flash fell on the floor. And I thought, I've just got to wing it. I can't stop now and start again. Mm. So, and, and he sort of crunched across on his high heels, across all the broken glass, <laughs> went there, stood there ready to do the picture. And we started uh, taking the photograph. And as it was doing, the, the sun just came out and I got a glint in his eye. And I said to him, I said, oh, you're already taking, taking the fist, aren't you? And he said, and you just got your picture, didn't you? I went, absolutely. Well, Three-minute photo session. One week I was there for him, it's three minutes. Wow. And, and we did a quick shot of his band as well after that, and that was it. So I came back with one roll of film, of 120 film, so it was 12 pictures on the film, and got eight pages out of it. So, I mean, he gi he gave it. When he, when he, he was there, he was sort of, wah, wah. And then when, when he, he then, I said, you know, and he said, you just got your picture, and that was the picture I got, which because he sort of went, uh -huh, you know, gave, he then gave an expression in a way. Yeah, amazing. So that was, and, and that game was thrilling, because you got a film, and you think, and so I came all the way back, thought, do I put this through the x-ray machine? Or oh, you yeah. know, <laughs> like, Is this going to work? But um, but it's that's that's what I've always loved about photography. It's, it's that kind of... You, 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 it's this is a super tension, and, mm. and especially and when you're, you know, I, I couldn't mess about. I just had to had to go for it, and um, and it was uh, it worked, which was good. So you said you don't have an agent. Um, no. I'm just curious of how you get these, like how these opportunities came to you. Like, were you contacted directly off of other work you'd done? The well, the first one I did was the Bow Wow Wow with Martin yeah. McLaren and Vivian, um, and that. Then I got a call from EMI and there was a guy called Rob War who was a product manager there and he said, I've got a bunch of lads from Birmingham, see what you can make of them. And it was Duran Duran and that was my second job. So I went off and did their first ever shoots. So we did their stuff out and they came to my side of studio in Nottingham on Carrington Street. Mm -hmm. So they came up, uh, which is just by the train station. And uh, it was just a little attic room, and they came up there, and we did a whole shoot there. Then I went, took them down to Milton Keynes because I was really interested in all the. It was just opening then, Milton Keynes, and there was a big glass box which looked really ominous, and I thought it looked really futuristic. And also because their music was kind of um, electronic y and stuff, it, it worked well with the flash and blur. So when I did the Rio album cover, I had them up on the top of a um, uh, top of a building, looking out with all the nights, uh, you know, all the night lights, and I shot them with a flash. So same thing, shot them with a flash. They then had to stand still for thirty seconds. Or as I was reminded by one of them the other day when I saw him, I said, "Yeah, thirty chimpanzees, one chimpanzee, two chimpanzees," <laughs> because it was thirty seconds. They had to stay they, to, to expose it all. Yeah. They'd gone against the sky, so they were all black, but they didn't want to move. And then at the end of that exposure, I kicked the tripod, and it went like that which gave it a bzzz, which I thought looked like that sounded like the music so again that worked as well you were just 
playing with ideas. Was that and, an intentional kick? Or yeah, 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 intentional kick, intentional. yeah, because, I, because of the flash and blur. And I was doing it, and I thought, well, I, I ended up having to change the... This is now technical. So I shot it and, and kept, the, the obviously, the exposure down, and it was focused on them, so they were probably, like, two metres from me. But the, all the lights in the distance were, were out of focus because it was a narrow depth of field. So I then turned the focus to infinity, so then it would expose all the lights in, uh, so that they were sharp as well well and then as i say kick the tripod just to give it a bit of an energy and it worked you know, wow. which is quite good sometimes you do it and you come back and it didn't work you know, but, <laughs> but it's that one it did work for them so how my work came about was then that would come out and it would say the pictures would end up in magazines and then somebody else would pick up and say well any chance you know you could do a, a shoot for us so i ended up doing a lot of the um in fact Again, how I got started when I did the Bow Wow Wow one, they then did a video and I was doing the stills on the video and the guy, um, a chap called Eric Fellner, was the producer who then went on to do um, all the four weddings and a funeral. He's a producer, big American producer, then um, we're called Working Title now. And they did loads of stuff and they were in, we had a little studio in London by then and they were operating out of the studio. So it was just everybody you kind of met at the time, we got together and did things. Mm. And so I was doing the stills, they were doing the videos and stuff. And, uh, and I mean, I learned so much about lighting from hanging around on video shoots and seeing how that happened because Again, as and when we're at Trent, as you know, it's that that technical side. Unless you're doing something, you don't really do much of it. And we're going and saying, "Oh, so that's how they get that effect." And that's how you know. So that was always really good fun. Um, and we ended up being all you know, Sri Lanka doing shoots and stuff. So, in fact, in Hungry Like the Wolf, Duran Duran's one of Duran Duran's singles. Um, there's a, about 40 seconds in. There are two nuns in a cafe in in the middle of a in Colombo in Sri Lanka, and Simon Le Bon comes and sort of turns the table upside down. Well, one of the nuns had food poisoning. He said, "What can we do?" I said, "Oh, I'll be the nun." So I'm the other nun. <laughs> so that's one of my claims to fame. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great story. Yeah. That's yeah. a great claim to fame. Yeah. <laughs> you, you need to dedicate that story to Claire Lockwood, who, who whose parting sort of request was, can you get him to talk about Duran Duran? <laughs> right, right, so, right, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I think she's after a ticket or something. No, well, definitely. <laughs> Perhaps no, the birthday yeah, invitation, yeah. I don't know. I'd love to know who you think, the, 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 the sort of people listening to this, our students and, and, mm. and others, who you think they should look at? Who have they, who have they perhaps forgotten? I mean, we, we mentioned a book that most photographers won't have heard of by Michael M. Persig. Right. But what 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 um what what other photographers do you think you you, you mentioned Brian Griffin yeah for I mean I I I I think in a way what what I loved about when I was at Trent we had a big library there and we were always being sent in to go and go and search so somebody would look at your work and say you should have a look at Lee Freelander mm. or you should have a look at um you know if it was it was whoever it may be so there'd be lots of names being floated around and if you see I mean I often see whenever I see students work and we're going through it I say have you do you know so and so and they might know lots of contemporary photographers but you go back and say no have a look at you know Julian Margaret Cameron, for instance, or have a look at somebody sort of quite historical, Cartier-Bresson. You know, I mean, Cartier-Bresson's pictures are amazing, a decisive moment and stuff. But you just think, oh, yeah, that's old stuff. But actually, when you start to look at them, they're beautifully composed, beautifully. You know, that he was about the um, decisive moment was his thing. So there's a lovely picture of a man jumping over a puddle and he hasn't quite hit the puddle. And it's that anticipation mm -hmm that I love in photography as well. So it's, it's, it's those sorts of things. But I think in a way you, it becomes from what you're doing, what, how you actually take pictures, people then see a little, you know, old geezers like me will see something in it and say, you should have a look at this guy's work or have a look at her work, you know. And it's, and it's often it's, it's um, um, you know, it, that sort of thing will, will lead to other ideas. And, and I mean... I'm forever, it's not just, I mean, I love modern architecture and I, that inspires me and design inspires me and also, so it's not just photography mm. and paintings, you know, I'm going to the Rothko paint uh, show out in Paris just to go and have a look. That's yeah. all. I'm not going for any other reason because I've seen his paintings, but there's a bigger, bigger collection out there at the moment. So I think, well, it's just one that's just, just get the feel of what it is like looking at his paintings, like that sort of stuff. And, you know, I'll probably end up just doing stripes next, you know, <laughs> like his paintings, whatever. But it, it's it's um, the joy of, of, of seeing, really. That's beautiful. 
That is great. That yeah, just that, that constant feeding. You, see, you get your hunger and enthusiasm again. Just yeah. constantly feeding that for that. Yeah. We're asking questions like, how do you come up with your ideas? What you, yeah. you you know, it's and you're you're t- telling us now. The next thing is you're going to go and look at Rothko. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. I mean, as you say, there's quite a few, this like like the print story. Or there's quite a few stories of of, of things where, the, how the work came about, or how it changed, and things. You know, and it's. It, um, I think that's what's often quite interesting is it always be ready for the unexpected mm. you know um, I mean I, one more story okay ABC I went out to we, we went out with Mark Farrow who I, I say I really like his work um, he's a designer at ABC with a band and we went out to Brasilia because we, the album's called Skyscraping and we said well rather than doing the obvious and doing skyscrapers we do this amazing Brasilia is a, a, a guy called Oscar Nima who was a, an architect and he built the whole city and it's the most modernist beautiful um, shaped buildings and stuff very interesting stuff anyway we ended up shooting there and I had the panoramic camera with me to do because I wanted to get oops, sorry big wide visions whoops and um when we got there, we arrived, and I opened all the film the film up for my. I was using a, I think it's a, a Bronica or a, a Mamiya or something, a, a medium format camera, and got all the film out, and it was all two twenty size sized film, which is double the length, which works in the panoramic camera, but doesn't work in any other camera. So I had to shoot the whole thing on this panoramic bar two rolls of which I had of the other stuff, and it was only because I hadn't checked before we went out. What the film was it? Yeah, it's a. It was the the same film, the same packaging, but instead of it was a double the size rather than the thing. So all it tells is two twenty rather than one twenty at the bottom of the the bottom of the tin, <laughs> and I hadn't noticed that. So I had to shoot the whole thing with the panoramic. And they kept saying, "Why are you doing it like that?" I said, "It's working so well." <laughs> and I also knew that I could crop in because <laughs> it was like a normal thing. And so, but actually, because of that, it then changed the whole style of the shoot. Because then I thought you were sort of looking at staircases, or you were looking at, you know, these amazing curves of buildings and stuff. And you think, well, let's just do it like that, with a curve and a car at the end, and just playing around with it. So it ended up being being a huge success. But I haven't told uh, Martin Fry of ABC that's what <laughs> happened. Your secret's safe with him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this has been such a great conversation. Good. Thank you so much for having us here. It's I'm delighted. Really enjoyable. Delighted. delighted. Yes, thanks, Ellie. My pleasure.